Hey everybody, this is Mike Miller and welcome to the Strike Up the Band podcast. Today, through the miracles of modern technology, I am talking with a gentleman in the United Kingdom, Dr. Brett Baker. Brett is an artist for Wrath Trombones. He is the principal trombone with the Black Dyke Band. He is a past chairman of the British Trombone Society, uh, past International Trombone Association secretary, and a freelance performer, an educator, and also works in the marketing area for Dennis Wick. So he's a busy man. Uh, Dennis, thank you. Dennis. Brett, thank you so much for taking time to be with me today. It's very flattering to be called Dennis. Uh, that's that's <laughs> absolutely fine. Yes. Uh Dennis Wick being a, a great guy. So no, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. And thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a thrill to be on and uh, very happy to be here. Yeah, as, as I, I told Brett in the email, trying to get him to be on the show, he doesn't remember me, but we met in the uh, shower room at International Trombone Association about five years ago, very briefly. <laughs> yeah, that's, so, that's not the sort of thing I tend to remember is meeting people in the <laughs> shower room. I mean... <laughs> Anyway, uh, so Brett was just talking about uh, his recent adventures with the Black Dyke Band with the contest. So why don't you start off and tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, we uh, don't always get an opportunity to play in the European um, Brass Band Championships, but we did get the opportunity this year. Uh, we qualified a number of years ago, but because of the pandemic, uh, obviously a couple of the contests uh didn't happen they were postponed and then different venues were changed because each year the european is in a different host city and uh so things were changed around a little bit it was in birmingham england last year and then uh our qualification from a couple of years ago then led us to malmo and so uh we went out there we did have a few challenges with flights getting there and uh, so it was necessary to bus it all the way down to Heathrow instead of flying out of Manchester. So we traveled overnight, arrived in Malmo about an hour before we were to play. And then we just had a quick wash, went on stage, did our first performance, and then we could relax for a little bit. So it was a little bit, um, a little bit, I wouldn't say it was stressful. I don't think it was stressful, but it was certainly full on. And uh, everybody was full of uh, high adrenaline. And we we did a really good show. Uh, we had two performances. So one on the Friday, one on the Saturday. And it was the own choice on the Saturday. And we won the own choice on the Saturday, which is great. Uh, but we only came third in the Friday, um, which we thought we played pretty well, actually. It worked out okay. But anyway, so that meant we we were joint first with points. And the way the Europeans work is that whoever has the most points in the Friday then wins the competition overall. So we were, even though we were joint on points, we ended up coming second, which is a real disappointment. But there we are. I know the band in Switzerland, uh, Treza Toi, and they are a very fine band of of many talented young players. So um, I'm it's a, it's a well deserved result for them with 80% of their players never playing in a European competition before. So they're all brand new to it. So that's a massive achievement from their point of view. Okay. How long have you played with Black Guy? Uh, many, many years. It's uh, a bit complicated because I had a little bit of a sabbatical, let's say, uh, in 2014 through till 2016. And even then, I still played in a Europeans with the with the band and played in a competition then. So uh, on and off, I've been with the band now for 24 years. Okay. And that's uh, that's one of the most uh, famous and well-known brass bands in the world. Can you tell us a little bit about, about the history of that group? Yes. So the band uh, has been around uh, since about 1855, and it was a sort of brass and reed before that. But uh, a guy called John Foster who was a mill owner uh, in, in the Halifax area at the time, set the band up, and he was a French horn player. They did uh, when he appointed this amazing new conductor for the band is that the amazing new conductor then fired John Foster from French horn to play in the band. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was... A, and I think that's where things were always of a, a very high quality with the band. They were where they were a no-nonsense band that would do lots and lots of uh, um, fresh new things uh, and uh, certainly wanted to be the, the best band that they could 
And uh, so, yes, they're, they're the most successful contesting band um, in history. And uh, they've been going a long, long time. Um, and uh, it's a lot of the uh, famous cornet players, trombone players, euphonium players um, have, have played in Black Dyke. I think it's everybody's um, sort of ambition to go and play with the band, even if it isn't for for a contest just to go and make a rehearsal or do a concert or something like that. So uh, it, it certainly does seem to be very desirable. That said, I don't really worry about any of that stuff. I just go on and, and play and do the thing I need to do. And uh, I don't really worry about the, the whole pressure thing about playing in one of these established bands. I, I, uh, I had Philip from the Corey band on uh, a few months ago when I first started the podcast and uh, uh, the thing I was amazed at with them, and I guess it's probably the same with you guys, is that everybody is just doing it uh, for the love of music as opposed to getting paid. Is that the same way with the uh, Black Knight? Yeah, absolutely. So there was a, a period of time um, many years ago now. So uh, I, I think when I started playing in the 80s and getting into the late 80s, early 90s, then you could say that um, some of the brass bands then had employees. So what I mean by that, that if they were sponsored by a certain uh, building society, a bank, or if they were sponsored by a factory or they were sponsored by a mill, then they might have got employment in that particular company that sponsored the band. Uh, but those days disappeared very much in the late 80s, early 90s. And before that, a lot of the players were, were doing that. They were moving companies and therefore playing in a certain certain band as a result but uh, everybody that plays in Corey, everybody that plays in black dyke it's very much a hobby but as our conductor would say uh it's no different to olympians where they do mm -hmm. it for the uh for the uh the prestige rather than uh the the fame rather than the fortune let's put it that way mike <laughs> yeah i think that you mentioned the term famous euphonium player a minute ago i, I don't know if there's actually such a thing at least <laughs> in this country <laughs> well uh there's there's a number of euphonium players now in okay. the states um and uh, i mean i guess the most famous guys there i mean there's yeah. it wasn't it falcone was a famous euphonium uh, oh yeah i mean with it if you are in the uh you know in the brass community then then uh yes you've heard of these guys but if, you're not going to see them on the tonight show or anything oh no no exactly <laughs> and and that's that's one of the, the the things that uh we we often uh compare uh brass banding to morris dancing which is uh something that is a very uh specialized and niche thing i guess uh over in the uk and um but but that said, I mean, there are certainly occasions, particularly with bands like uh, Corey that you've mentioned and Black Dyke, where we do get TV appearances and we get um, certainly live stream performances that we do and uh, playing to audiences of around 2000 people in, in some of the best halls around the place. So whether it's uh, the Albert Hall in London, whether it's the Symphony Hall in Birmingham or indeed Carnegie Hall, then uh, we, we've uh, been fortunate to, to play in... Um, Places such as those. Yeah, that, that's great. That's great. Uh, I kind of skipped over things. Usually, I start an interview by asking people, uh, you know, about, a little bit about their musical background. So, could we jump back to that and tell us yeah. uh, a little bit how you got your start and so forth? Absolutely. So, um, and it's funny you you mentioned Phil Harper. So, I've known Phil Harper from the National Youth Band. We sat in the same youth band together um, many years ago, so we know each other well. But my uh, and he now lives in Gloucestershire, in Gloucester, actually, which is the county that I grew up in. And so I started playing in a place that will not be recognisable to those in the United States. But it's uh, there's two, maybe three regions in the UK that are uh, areas of forest, because a lot of our forestry disappeared because of the whole Industrial Revolution and things like that. And one of them is the New Forest down in Hampshire, and the other one is the Forest of Dean, which is in between England and Wales uh, on the Severn Estuary. And so there are pockets, um, I think it's fair to say, of brass banding activities that take place in various parts of the country. And so Cornwall and Devon have a, a, a very... Um, uh, a very busy time down there and there's lots of brass bands in that area they tend to be um in a lot of the towns and villages there and of course there's also mines and then you've got yorkshire 
as you'd expect, and Lancashire and the Manchester area where there's lots of brass bands, particularly the Saddleworth area where they do the Whit Friday contest, there tends to be a lot of activity with brass bands. But the Forest of Dean, which was a mining area because it's very close to Wales, um, iron ore and then coal, there were lots of brass bands and there were colliery brass bands in that area. And so uh, I grew up in a place called Bream, that's B-E-R-A-M, like the fish, and uh, they had a colliery there, but they also had a uh, brass band. It was at one point the largest village in England. And so I started my playing there and then progressed on to uh, another local band that also um, was what they call a championship section band. So in England, like the football um, scenario, like soccer, we have um, fourth section, third section, second section, first section, and then championship and so I was fortunate when I was 14 to join a, a championship section band and then played with them for a little while and then went to Flowers Band, uh, which is a band that's are doing very, very well at the moment. They're um, certainly in, I think, number six, seven in, in the world rankings at the moment. So I played for them for a number of years and then I went to university at Salford and I studied economics. So I didn't do music. And so in doing economics, uh, I was fortunate enough to also participate in the brass band course that took place next door at uh, University College Salford, as it was then, um, and was uh, lucky to get um, or, or rub shoulders with and have lessons off and get advice from the likes of David King and Roy Newsom, who were there at the time and, and have have lessons. Um, and then I decided to go and do uh a couple of um, postgraduate business courses, moved back down to the Forest of Dean, moved back up and then joined Black Dyke Band in 2000. And so, uh, oh, and in between then, I was playing for Fairies Band. I should mention that. So Fairies Band, uh, who had a really successful period in the 90s, uh, I spent five years, five enjoyable years at Fairies Band before I then moved back down to Gloucestershire, back up to um, Cheshire. And that's where I, I live at the moment. I've lived in Cheshire for about the last uh, ooh, 20 yeah, 24 years or so I've lived in the Cheshire area, which is um, uh, you've got bands like Foden's and Fairies and Leyland not too far away in, in that particular part of northwest England. So that's my sort of background and uh, many other things in between that I've probably missed out. Okay, so uh, were, you, were you working in music during this time, or did you, you, I think you mentioned before that you maybe worked in computers a little bit, or what kind yeah, of job so did you... Uh, it's it's many and varied. So I was lucky to be sponsored through my economics degree by a, a local company. Um, I mean, this is this is all very very strange. But we've the the Forest of Dean is is a very unique area, and there's quite a lot of composers that have either been born or lived in the Forest of Dean. And so there's uh, I was um, lucky enough to work for a company that uh, made fork truck tires in uh, this place called Lydney, which is where Herbert Howells, if you've heard of any of these brass band test pieces, there's two amazing test pieces by a gentleman called Herbert Howells. And he taught both Derek Bourgeois and Philip Wilby. And so that is the area where I used to work. Uh, I was working for this fork truck uh, tire company. And before that, I was a gardener just to get a bit of cash. And this millionaire guy, I used to do do his garden and he owned this company and then said, oh, come along and uh, work at this company and we'll sponsor you through university. And so I worked in the um, marketing and sales department of uh, this company down in the Forest of Dean. And then they sponsored me through university. I then moved back down there and did a couple of years, almost a sort of um, um, say thank you to them and sort of after they'd spent all this money on me, I thought I need to do some work for them for a couple of years. So I was playing in flowers band when I moved back down there and, and doing quite a bit of teaching and then starting to do quite a bit of solo work uh, and some CDs. And then I moved back up North after that point. But um, yeah, certainly uh, when I then moved back up, I thought I was going to be a professional musician. I thought, why not try um, playing trombone for a living? So I did a bit of shadowing and I took some postgraduate music courses instead of the uh, the other courses that I did. Um, and then for whatever reason, I don't know whether it was, if I'm honest, boredom or whether I just was attracted to other things. But the orchestral way of life and sitting there reading a book and reading Bar's Rest mm -hmm. was not my cup of tea. So I decided, no, actually, what I want to do is I want to be a teacher and a soloist and playing brass bands and playing wind bands. 
I don't want to sit there just reading bars rest. Uh, lovely though that is when you've got a, a, a fantastic piece to play, whether it be, you know, Marla three or uh, Shostakovich, whatever it might be. Um, my attention span is uh, not great. So I needed to be busy doing things. And so um, after doing my uh, diploma in music and then a master's in music, I became a classroom teacher and I taught IT. So I did that for a number of years and then that got me into teaching music because they never have enough music teachers at these schools. So as well as doing IT, I was uh, head of a department there. I started teaching music as well. And a job came up uh, actually lecturing at the university that I was studying at to do my master's and my doctorate. So I ended up then working at the University of Salford. It all went sort of full circle. And I ended up teaching, conducting and performance, uh, solo performance and professional practice, which is basically how do you do your tax returns and how do you make it as a musician from a business point of view? Um, and I did that up until about 2019. Um, and it's at that point that I decided to go back into industry. And I now work for a marketing. I now work as a marketeer, as a, the marketing lead for Dennis Wick products. Wow, that's a lot. Yes. Is, is your doctorate in music or is it in like business it is. or something? It okay. is, yeah. My doc my doctorate's in uh in actual uh performance, yeah. So okay. performance. It's it's interesting. I've you and, and several other folks in the brass band world I've talked to, you know, you talk about the difference in brass band and, and orchestra. And you know, orchestra players are great players, you know. I've and there's so much great music in that area, but you're right, you can study for 10 years and you get a job and you spend most of your job sitting there <laughs> playing footballs and counting rests. Yes, that's <laughs> right. Oh, there, there are some fabulous players uh, in, in a number of orchestras, whether it be in the U S I mean, a lot of my friends play in an orchestra um, and, and I mean, I enjoy listening to it. I enjoy listening to them, but um, I'm very, very, I find it very difficult to, uh, to just sit there and listen. I, I need to be doing things, um, I guess. And so I'm, I'm very much, uh, I want to be participating and, and doing something and playing rather than necessarily just listening to a fabulous orchestra do their thing. Yeah, I know. We just recently started a brass band here in, in town where I am. In fact, we have our first concert uh, next week. So Excellent. like I said, it's, it's brand new. And you know, a lot of the guys, there's a trumpet professor from a, nearby college who so, said, you know, this is the hardest stuff I've ever played. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, that's right. Technically uh, and stamina-wise, it's a very, very different scenario. And I think that's why a lot of people enjoy doing it. So there's quite a lot of trumpet players that will, uh, having not experienced that before, will then get into um, playing in a brass band. And the same with the euphonium players as well, um, because there's just so much more to do. It's just you're on you're on your toes all the time. You're really having to think about what you're doing. You're basically the string parts of an orchestra if you're playing in a brass band as a brass player. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, I, I first became aware of you when I, I saw you in the solos at the, the ITF in Indiana a few years ago, like I mentioned. Uh, and just for those listeners, Brett came and he played, what, five or six solos in a row with the uh, Central Ohio Brass Band. And I, I swear, I don't think I heard you clip a note. So how did you get how did you get started in your solo career? And, and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's always something that I've been interested in. I've been keen to um, commission composers from lots of different areas of music to to write for the trombone, because I think it was fair to say that uh, there was more music uh, coming out for um, in particular trombone and orchestra, but there wasn't an awful lot coming out for uh, trombone and wind band or brass band other than those Arthur Pryor charts and, and the Herbert Clark charts from those um, Civil War days in, in America many years ago now. And so other than that, there wasn't a lot of music available. So um, I started getting into solo work basically because I was asked to do it. Somebody said, oh, well, you know, you, you, you seem to be doing pretty well playing in the bands. Why don't you come and solo with this local choir or come and solo with a band? Um whether that be in Europe or then a couple of times in the States and also in Australia. And in some cases, it was just from meeting people. They would either travel over to the UK and say, well, we're looking for somebody to come over in a year's time. Do you fancy it? 
Um, and I guess one of my problems is that I can't say no to anything. So uh, back then I was just saying yes to anything that would come along, playing with lots of different groups, playing in big bands, playing in wind bands, uh, playing with choirs and and just really trying out new and different types of music um, to see if it would fit with different genres. And that's something that I was really interested in. And that's why from that point, I then got into asking uh, composers to write music for me so that they could do something um, a little bit different and we could get a lot more brass band music out there for trombone because there's certainly loads of things for euphonium there's loads of things out there for cornet but um, I think um, it, it was fair to say that there wasn't an awful lot for trombone there's probably about five pieces and that's it that people would play okay uh, yeah, I re excuse me. I just re at that concert, I remember you played like a whole bunch of different styles. I think you played an Arthur Pryor, and uh, I don't remember exactly what else you played, but it was different, all kinds of different pieces. It was very interesting. Yeah, so, I, th I think that was a history of uh, brass band music, and so it was going from those early days uh, where uh, the the repertoire was quite limited, I guess, in terms of range and in terms of uh, how how it could be expressed. And then going from that to um, the the nineteen seventies, when there was some some fantastic pieces written for a gentleman called Don Lusher, who was a um, a British jazz trombone player, um, and was on the TV uh, loads and loads of times uh, as I was growing up. So he was very much uh, somebody that I looked up to as a, as a, a young player. And then uh, from there, in the nineteen eighties, uh, that's. Uh, and the late 80s and 90s, the likes of Derek Bourgeois writing the trombone concerto, which um, gets played an awful lot in the States these days, um, to uh, the pieces that then I've had commissioned. So um, it's, yeah, there's there's lots of material out there now, but that wasn't the case, um, certainly when I was growing up. Okay. Uh, one thing we talked about before we started, uh, so that we actually both play Wrath trombones. Uh, you're, yeah. You're an artist for them, and I'm just a customer. But uh, <laughs> I, I love my rap. Uh, how long have you how long have you been playing a rap? Well, it's funny you should say that. So I went over to one of the ITFs that was last minute in New Orleans. It was supposed to be in Asia that year, I think, and it was cancelled for whatever reason. It they couldn't they couldn't make it work in Asia. And so then a guy called Ken Hanlon, who was the president of the uh, International Trombone Association at the time, he said, I'll, I'll put on a regional event um, in Las Vegas. And then so but before they do that, let's try and get something going in New Orleans. So they set up to have an ITF in New Orleans. And I went along to that and played. And I think I was secretary of, of the association back then anyway. So I had to be there anyway, but I thought, well, I might as well do some playing. And uh, I was coming back from New Orleans on the flight back. And who should I bump into but Mick Rath? And uh, and so as a result of that, we actually, for whatever reason, we managed to uh, sit quite close to each other on the plane. And so we were chatting in the lounge just before you get on the plane and we were chatting on the on the um, plane. And I'd, I'd got a situation where I'd been given a new instrument. I won't say what make it was, Um and uh, I'd been given several instruments before that, and they were absolutely fine, and I, I was very happy to play them. But I'd been given uh, the most recent one to play on, um, and it just wasn't working for me. So I said to Mick Rath, would you mind having a look at the instrument and just you know see what was wrong with it? Because it didn't play the same way as the other two that I'd had previously. Um, and so I took it along to his uh, workshop and he said, right, well, while you're here, you might as well try some of my instruments because you're here anyway and I'll have a look at this one. And so, of course, I tried some of these instruments and then I thought, these are just amazing. This is what I've been looking for. And from that point on, I thought, yeah, I need to be playing on one of these instruments because it was just so much easier to play. I could get, I could, my range was much better. Uh, I was much happier with the sound I was creating. It just didn't seem as uh, stuffy as, uh, the instrument that I'd, I'd got at the time. So that's when I converted to Wrath and I've been with them. That was 2005. And I think after working on various different um, guises of the instrument, the thing is about a Wrath trombone, for those of you that don't know, is they're modular. So it means you can put all these different components together. And then as a result of that, you can make a trombone the way you want it to be. So if you want a darker trombone sound, you can change some bits and make it darker. If you want it to be a little bit 
uh, easier in the high range. You can change something there. You can change the tuning slide or the lead pipe. And uh, so that's what I did. It, it took me about nine months to get something which I was then really, really happy with. And so after meeting them in 2005, I think I became an artist in 2006. And that's a long time ago now. So uh, what is that? 17 years? Something like that. I've been with them a long time. Yeah, I, I got <laughs> I, I got mine in 2016 at the uh, American Trombone Workshop in, in Washington, D.C. And what was so funny is talking about Mick. He was there with his horns with Dylan Music, and yeah. uh, and I didn't I didn't know who he was, and, and I'd heard of Rath, but I I didn't know that much about him. And I, I I picked up another trombone, and I really liked. I I think it was a German trombone of some sort, and I was try, I started trying to ask how much that horn was, and I asked Mick, you know how much this horn is, you know, I didn't I didn't know who he was, and he was trying to find out how much this other horn was for me, like he was just like the retail sales guy for uh for Dylan, and uh. Then I just started playing a Rath, and I was like, well, this is, this is really nice. And next thing you know, I had given him my Edwards and another couple of thousand dollars, and, and I came home with a Rath. So I uh, really, really enjoyed that horn. And I've, shout out to Mick. I mean, if you, if, you, if you email, like, you know, customer service at Rath, he's the guy that answers your email. So, yeah, yeah that's yeah, exactly. good, yeah, it's, good support. It's, uh... It's a family company and uh, it's very much, um, you know, there's there's 20 odd people that, that work there in the company. It's a small company, really, but they they uh, certainly make uh, what you'd call bespoke instruments, really, for uh, various people, you know, from anything from an alto trombone to a contrabass trombone. Um, and, you know, you can you can pretty much if you've got the money, you can have whatever you want. But uh, in general, um there's been a big change from uh, originally them being uh, very popular for jazz instrumentalists and jazz trombone players to then going into the brass band mu movement uh, in a in a serious way. And most uh, brass band trombone players now will play on a Michael Rath. And then a couple of years ago, they brought out what's called the R6, which means that they're now also moving into the orchestral uh, arena and making trombones for the orchestral movement um and for players that play in orchestras so they they now do the, the complete range of instruments whilst before when they started up many many years ago it was mainly for jazzers i think okay uh yeah i know like uh, carol jarvis plays one and uh there's a i don't know if you're familiar with aubrey logan uh mm -hmm. she's a well-known singer and trombonist here in the states she plays at wrath so i know you've just got a few more minutes can you tell us uh this last little bit of time uh how you Came to be associated with uh, with Dennis Wick and a little bit about uh, what you do there. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I, when I was um, doing my, I guess it was doing my masters. It might have been diploma. I wanted to have some lessons off um, a, a whole range of different people, and uh, so I thought, why not go and have some lessons off Dennis Wick? So that's many many years ago, and that's when I first got to meet Dennis, and. Um, so I had a few lessons off him and it was really, really uh, a, a phenomenal experience for me. And it, it certainly moved me forward as a player and as a soloist. And I've played uh, many of uh, the pieces that were written for Dennis Wick. Then years later, uh, it's funny how this all goes full circle, but uh, a gentleman called Stephen Greenall, who was uh, once um, the director of the International Trombone Association many years ago when I was the secretary and um I managed to be talking to Steve and he was saying, oh, well, um, there's actually an opportunity for um, a marketeer in Dennis Wick. Would you be interested in looking at that? And um, I thought to myself at the time, I thought, well, I'm not sure that I, I perhaps got the skills to be able to do the, the, the job in question. And so then he said, well, I'll tell you what, you come and meet Stephen Wick, which is Dennis's son and myself, and we'll have a chat about it. And it just turned out that the job in question was working with, Dennis Wick artists and uh, working on campaigns and looking at uh, new products that need to come through. Well, they don't need to come through, but it's it's good if we can work with artists to to bring out new products, whether it be mutes or whether it be um, mouthpieces. And so that's my job really is uh, campaigns and um, working with artists to then produce new material and uh, interviews talking about various aspects of of playing and uh, communicating what the different products do uh, to a, a lot of people out there so thoroughly enjoying it it's it's 
um, fair to say that the bulk of the activity is in either the US or Europe. And so I spend a lot of time speaking to my colleagues in the States and uh, working with artists out there where we've got a, a huge artist roster of about uh, 60 individuals. All right. Well, I have a Dennis Wick mute. Can I be a Dennis Wick artist now? <laughs> well, you'd normally need a little bit more than just the mute, but uh, uh, okay. All I, right. that's work in progress, Mike. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there should be a fair representation. You should have, you know, like the really top guys and then just some average guys like us, <laughs> like, like me, rather, as, a, <laughs> as an artist. Nah, it's uh, just for anybody who may not know exactly who Dennis Wick is, or could you tell us a little bit about him? I know he's, uh, you know, one of the great uh, trombonists of all time in the UK and well known right. for uh, for his instrument development and so forth. That's right. So uh, Dennis Wick was in the London Symphony Orchestra and played there for a number of years. So when you listen to the first ever Star Wars film or episode four, as it is com confusingly called now, or Superman. So those <laughs> films from the 1970s, 77 to say about the um, uh, early to mid 80s, that was Dennis Wick playing trombone on all of those tracks. So Morris Murphy, the famous trumpet player that would play on those tracks, and Dennis Wick would be the trombone player that you could hear playing. And uh, so he was at the LSO then doing uh, a number of things. And as he uh, was touring and playing with the orchestra, he was also having requests to make uh, mouthpieces and mutes. And so he experimented with that sort of thing and started making various uh, in spare time making various mutes and mouthpieces for people in the orchestra and from there other orchestral players started asking him could they do this that and the other could they make a french horn mute could they make a french horn mouthpiece could they make a trumpet mouthpiece and so it escalated from uh, just one favor to somebody uh, and trying to get some mutes that would work for that section because they were using american trombones then as well they brought some american trombones over uh, rather than those that were being built in the UK. And so they therefore needed mouthpieces and mutes that would fit with those instruments. And so that's why Dennis started doing what he did. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, was he, I guess he had some background in machining. Because uh, not not just anybody can just say, make a mouthpiece. I guess he had some experience or training in, in running a lathe. Well, I All think right. in the early days, he basically uh, knew other people that could do that and would request them to do certain things and then would oh, experiment okay. and then try it. And then if something didn't quite go right, he'd take it back and he'd get feedback from other people as well as himself, get them to make it in a different way, uh, work on the shape of the mouthpiece, work on the different cups uh, and sizes of, of different mouthpieces. So there was a lot of experimentation in those early days. And then from there... Uh, yeah, of course, he he built up a lot of knowledge over the years in terms of how things would then work and how to uh, maximize the shape and how much material you should keep on a mouthpiece and what sizes would be optimal. So, uh, I mean, he's he's got a, a wealth of knowledge after 60 years of working in that industry. Then he there's not a lot he doesn't know about um, instruments, mouthpieces and mutes. OK, uh, is he still active in the business at all? He's, he uh, certainly still takes uh, an interest in what goes on in the business. He's still um, very involved in it, um, but he's 92. So you can imagine he takes a little bit more of a back step now than he did uh, a, a few years back. But yeah, he still takes a, a, a lot of active interest in what's going on. All right. Well, it is uh, it is almost time uh, for your next meeting. So, uh, Brett, I certainly appreciate your time. Uh, you know, it's been been quite a pleasure talking to you. And uh, wish you good luck with everything that you're doing. Thank you very much. And thanks for uh, the interview. Thanks for uh, right. reaching out. And uh, best of luck with these with this project in the future. Okay. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay.